Good morning. All right, I'll try that just one more time. Good morning. <laughs> Merry Christmas. I was amazed this week as I went into a few stores and I said Merry Christmas to a person. One lady said to me, you know, you're the first person to wish me a Merry Christmas. And I thought, wow, that's just strange. So I want to encourage you as part of the announcements today, when you see someone at a store, give them a beautiful smile and wish them a Merry Christmas. Regardless, take the risk. They may not look at you in a you know normal way, but on the other hand, just maybe you might be the first person to wish them a Merry Christmas this year. A couple of announcements uh, that I'd like to bring to your attention as we get started. Christmas Eve services at what time? 6.30. On what day? <laughs> it hasn't changed. Isn't that great? So on the 24th, uh, we would love to have you join us for our Christmas Eve uh, celebration. Uh, I'm looking forward to what God might do in our midst. And it's a time when we we should feel free to invite people. If there is an opportunity this time of year to invite people to church, uh, do that. Invite them to join us to worship together uh, as, a, as a congregation. Um, but as we anticipate the remembrance of the first coming of Jesus, but we look forward to his second coming. Our porch pantry is always in need. Uh, there is opportunity for you to be able to support uh, and supply for that ministry. Uh, that allows people from our community who are food insecure to come up uh, to the porch of the church, the back end of the church, the entrance that we use for the office, to open up the lockers and to get some supply for themselves and for their families. Uh, once again this week, I had a gentleman that I met at the door there who was just so grateful uh, for the food that he was getting. Uh, and all he did was take a couple of cans of vegetables and a, a box of, uh, of macaroni. And, uh, and it was just, it was a blessing for me to receive um, that thanks on your behalf uh, because of your generous giving uh, and our ability to be able to give in that way. And if it brings a smile to my heart, Imagine the joy that it must bring to our Savior as we're doing that. Uh, the opportunities that we've had at our Wednesday evening, or sorry, our Wednesday noon meals um, at the porch pantry, uh, the barbecue has been terrific. We've been getting into some good conversations with people, building deeper relationships with them, and earning opportunities to be able to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, we don't need to earn an opportunity to proclaim Christ, but when we do, all the better. Uh, and so uh, please continue to pray for us, uh, George Meisner, as he gives direction in that ministry, uh, but also the many volunteers that we have. Goodness, what was it, George? We still had six, seven people this week uh, volunteering uh, in that ministry. So if you, if you want to be part of that, get a hold of George. He'll tell you how you can do that and how you can join us. We are going to be having a barbecue this Wednesday. We are going to be having a barbecue the following Wednesday between Christmas and New Year's. Some of the charitable organizations around town that are providing meals have decided to close down over Christmas. Um, we would choose to be open uh, and to be able to continue to provide in that way. So if you're able to uh, and you would like to, uh, please get a hold of George, get a hold of myself, um, and we would be pleased to direct you and, and to be part of that, uh, that opportunity. As we begin this morning, uh, let's open with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the privilege we have to remember Jesus. Thank you for the gift that you gave. God planned before the foundation of the world. Before one of us took our first breath, you planned salvation for us. And that's hard for us to imagine. And yet, God, you, through Jesus, created all things. Through your word, through your breath. All things came into existence, and all things are held together in him. And we give you thanks for that. As we celebrate this morning, we worship in song, as we worship in word and in scripture. Uh, Lord, may you get all the glory, both now and forevermore. And we ask that all in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. 
I'm going to invite Abigail to come up and to do our Advent reading this morning. As this week, let us consider the peace that Jesus brings to our hearts and our world. And that the Bible is the place we can find the promises of God that I think on those of these truths allow them to comfort our hearts. This Advent season, Second Thessalonians 3.16. Now may the Lord of peace give himself you peace at all times in every way, the Lord be with you all. As this week we focus our hearts on the Lord of peace who came down from heaven in the form of a baby. God knows that we are in a constant battle against fear. Fear was to hurt us, to make us react poorly rather than respond with love. Fear steals our joy. God has given us the gift of peace so we can live joy-filled lives as we celebrate the coming of Jesus. Pray that God's wonderful peace would be evident in our hearts and homes. This year, we have faced so much chaos and uncertainty. God's peace is something we need to grab and hold on to more than ever. May God's spirit bring us peace in the days leading up to Christmas and may be the uh, celebration of peace as we joyfully wait our King Jesus! That was awesome. Thanks, Abigail. Uh, let's stand as we uh, continue in our time of worship with some singing, uh, some Christmas carols. I think we're going to start with Hark the Herald Angels Sing.
to stand up here and listen to you all sing. It's really nice, especially Christmas carols. Uh, our next song is called I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. It's, it's not quite the traditional hymn that you're probably familiar with. Um, similar, the words are similar, the, the, uh, the melody is a little bit different, um, but you'll catch on quick. Let's pray. Peace on earth. What a dream. What a hope. What an expectation. But Lord, it is true. We live in a day where peace is hard to find anywhere. And our anticipation of such a thing is almost 
skeptical, if not cynical. And yet you've come to offer us peace in the midst of our turmoil. Hallowed be your name. Thank you, O oh God. It's not our circumstances and it's not our goodness and it's not our ability that brings peace to our world, to our troubles, to our struggles. The only thing is that your name depends on it. Hallowed be your name. We can't help but look to a God who loved us so much that at just the right time stepped into our world and into our mess and our trouble and offered us peace. Hallowed be your name. Thank you, O oh God. Thank you that in the midst of our struggles and our pain that you are near. In the midst of our distances, you are near. In the midst of our anxieties, you are near. And you love us. Thank you, God. Lord, we think of those who are not able to be with us today for one reason or another. We think of, of Ali, who's over in Europe, in France. Lord, I thank you that he's found a group of people that he can fellowship with. We've been praying for that, Lord, and I just pray you'd continue to allow him to fellowship and grow in that, uh, that Christian relationships uh, group that he's found out there. I pray a blessing on them today as they meet as well. And Lord, give Ali direction as to what he needs to be doing for his future, because that's still unsure for him. Lord, I think of, um, of Bonnie across the street, who's been struggling so much with her health. I thank you that this week she's finally gotten the help that she needs, and she's been moved to palliative care or is going to be moved to palliative care. I pray, God, that you would bring someone to her that can speak words of hope, that she might turn her heart to you, Lord, and be saved. Be kind, O oh God, to her even in her late days. Lord, I think of Doreen, who fell a couple of weeks ago and has been in the hospital. We were concerned that she would end up having to go to uh, another place for rehabilitation. And yet, remarkably, Lord, because you've answered prayer, uh, she has gotten up this week and started to walk and is going to be able to be home for Christmas. God, thank you for that. Thank you for the answered prayer. And there are so many things that we can thank you for, Lord, the healings that have taken place in individuals' lives, whether it's been relational healings or physical healings that have been done because of the name and the blood of Jesus. And we thank you for that. We thank you for the privilege that we have week after week of being able to come to you boldly, as your word says, to boldly approach the throne of grace and make our requests known to you. And when we do that, you hear us and you answer us when we pray. Thank you, God, for being faithful to that. Thank you, Lord, for the people here at this church that give faithfully week after week of their tithes and their offerings. So the, the, the amount that you have given them, they generously give to support the ministry here of this church, but also to care for those who you bring in contact with us each week right on the street here. God, I thank you that Main Street matters to you, that you have placed us here for this day and this time. Lord, continue to burn in us a passion for your word, that we might love your word, that we might chase after your word, that we might take your word and hide it in our hearts so that we might not sin against you. Thank you that your word brings refreshment, it brings clarity, it brings direction, and it brings hope to us. And I thank you that Jesus is the word. And it is him that we worship today. So, Lord, accept our praise, accept our gifts, accept our requests as our Father. Hallowed be your name.
Amen. Time for another song. Uh, let's stand up and sing again. Set the night wind to the little land. Do you see what I see? Way up in the sky, little man. Do you see what I see? A star. Some of you may have wondered what these are. These are our gift boxes. Every year we, in the past, or for many years in the past, we've given um, gift boxes through Samaritan's Purse to children overseas. But we have sensed that there's a need right here in our community for people that lie right within the shadow of our steeple. And so a couple of years ago, we got together and we got the idea through the, the idea of the gift boxes but to put together gift boxes like this with some Christmas reading in there um, for our guests who will receive it, uh, with some treats, uh, a coffee mug, and a couple of other things. To give people, particularly from In From The Cold, which is where we do this, uh, to give them a Christmas present, which they may not otherwise get. I remember the comments from a couple of years ago uh, at the early part of COVID when people said, this is the first time I've received a Christmas gift in years. I haven't received a Christmas gift when I was a kid. And you might think, well, it's only a few little goodies and some treats, but this box allows them to store some things that are precious to them. And they appreciate the box. You know, kind of like your kids that you spent a fortune on the Christmas present for and they play with the box. But in their case, this is something that allows them to hold some of the things that they have, the few things that they have left that they treasure. The other thing that is inside here is a, a coffee mug, a, a thermos type of mug that keeps their coffee warm. And they really appreciate that. 
Every once in a while, I still see people walking up and down the street with the coffee mug that we gave them last year for Christmas. And it's a wonderful thing to be able to do that. So this is part of what your tithes and offerings do, to be able to care for people in this community in need. And we're going to pray and ask God to bless each one of these uh, as a symbol of our love, but even greater is the symbol of the love of God for these people, that we might again have another opportunity to be able to share the love of Christ with them. Uh, special thanks to Jeff and to his family uh, and to Russ, who was here yesterday, packing all of these boxes together and putting them together for us uh, as we give that out. And special thanks to you who generously gave to be able to make this possible. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the privilege of being able to give. Uh, you've given so much to us, and this is just a small but tangible way of expressing your love to those that we meet and those that we have the privilege of serving right here on Main Street. And I pray that as the people from In From The Cold receive these gifts, I pray that they would receive them as a gift from you, as a gift that they recognize that there's people that care for them and love them. And Lord, let us do things more than just in um, physical gifting, but let us love them with our time. Let us love them by getting to know them and sharing with them the good news of hope that we've found in Jesus. We ask your blessing upon these gifts so that your kingdom might grow right here on Main Street. And we give you thanks for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Speaking of miracles, there was a certain couple that showed up late tonight. I can't seem to shake the impression they made on me. The girl was more fatigued than a woman should ever look. All she wanted was just a place to rest. But I had nothing. The husband pleading with such desperation. What kind of businessman would take pause with that? Huh? What could I do? Bethlehem was packed. <laughs> no fault of my own. And that's where the book would have closed on the matter had it not been for my dear, dear sweet wife. The, the jab in the ribs from her finger telling me I might want to rethink my position on things. I very clearly knew my options. A. I could find them a place to sleep, or B, I could find myself a place to sleep. <laughs> Seriously, my wife, Estelle, had seen something that I had completely missed. The girl, she was pregnant. There was no way I was going to leave her out in the cold night. But the barn, it was all ahead. They were grateful. There's something different about them. Something. It's a quirky word, a word we simply don't use anymore, but holy. It's really the only word that fits. They say the baby, that he's the Messiah, the one who's gonna, who's gonna change everything. Could he really be the one that we've been waiting for after all these years? All my life, this belief has uh, paralyzed me, I suppose you could say. But this, this has given me a chance to believe. Bethlehem will be waking up soon. People gonna want food in their stomach, they're gonna be registering for the census. All these people in their own little worlds, no one knowing that a savior has entered the world. Out of all the places on earth, God chose, God chose, he chose my place to 
bring hope into the world. I'm certainly not a very worthy man, but I am a grateful one. Estelle, I've never seen that woman happier in years. Ah. As for me, there will always be things to buy and sell, but this, all of this, this has given me a new kind of heart. A heart that believes. Oh, what a holy night. The Gospel of John ends with an interesting verse. It seems to allow for all kinds of imagination concerning the life of Jesus. John 21, verse 25 says, Now there are also many other th <clears throat> things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be noted. Well, John and the other gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all give us an interesting perspective on the life of Jesus. You could say almost snapshots from different scenes of the incarnation lived out amongst us during the days that Jesus walked physically here on the earth. So many places, so many events, so many encounters with Jesus took place so many details and circumstances, and they're not recorded. However, it doesn't mean that they didn't happen. And it doesn't mean that we can't wonder or imagine and even think of what exactly might have taken place in the details of Jesus' life. We don't hurt the text as long as we don't add to it things that are not doctrine, that are not part of Scripture. And where the Bible remains silent on some things, they need to be remained silent. But imagination is not something that we should forget. And I'm sure that between the pages, between the stories, between the visits of the shepherds and the magi, much took place. We don't know some of the details concerning the birth of Jesus, but Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 7, give us enough of a picture, even as small as it is, that we could allow our imaginations to stretch. And we might see what it was like at the arrival of Jesus on that first Christmas morning. Luke 2, 1 to 7 says this, at that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken by Quinarius when he was governor of Syria. Everyone returned to their ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee, and he took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for their baby to be born. She gave him, sorry, she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for him in the inn. That's it. There is no more. There's no more talk about the innkeeper. There's no more talk about the stable. There's no more talk about how it was, the cave. There's no more talk about whether it wasn't a cave, it was a stable, it was a barn. There's no more discussion. Oh, of course, we've heard all the stories, right? You've heard all the created stories. You saw a video that portrayed well the story. 
through someone's sanctified imagination. Today, I'm going to invite you to do that. Walk back 2,000 years with me today and meet Albert. Albert, the innkeeper. In this recorded story from Luke's gospel, Luke talks about the birth, that it came at a specific time, in a specific place, Bethlehem, at a specific point in history. It happened when Quirinius was the uh, governor over all of Syria. The locations that were mentioned in it are actually real. The places you can find on a map today, the Galilee area, Nazareth, Judea, even the town of David, Bethlehem. All of them specific places at exact coordinates that can be measured on any GPS today. Verified places that this couple traveled to. A census was underway. We know that census was underway. If you take a look at historical documents outside of the Bible, the writings of Josephus even verify the fact that when he was governor, Quirinius, that there was a census taken place. We can gain from that 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 was approximately the year 2 BC. The highest office, the highest authority in all of town, Caesar Augustus, decreed that there must be a census. And Luke even takes specific places there with spe specific people's names that are historical figures that we can measure all of these things there. Quirinius, David, Joseph, Mary, and her firstborn son, Jesus. Luke even gives us some more specifics in the story about what Mary did when she gave birth. That she took the child and wrapped the child in cloth, strips of cloth, and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And this is one of the places that we get to infer, or dare I even say read into, maybe wonder and dream and consider what actually happened that holy night. It's very healthy for us to stay within the framework of Scripture and stay within the framework and the context of that time and that date when it was written. But make no mistake, it's also extremely important for us to take any piece of Scripture that we read and hold it within that context. The context of the day, the context of the literary style, and the fashion so that we might understand what took place. How did Mary and Joseph know that the inn was full? How did they make their way to the stable or the place where there was a manger? Is it too much for us to think, to imagine that someone must have answered the door to tell them that there was no room in the inn? No place for them to stay that night. It makes all the sense in the world for us to be able to do that, to admit it, because the Bible doesn't specifically mention an Eden keeper and a sold out inn in Bethlehem. But there had to be likely someone there, someone to open the door, someone to make room for the parents and the child, the Son of God. Somebody figured out that that night in Bethlehem, when Joseph and Mary gathered together, knocking on doors, likely looking for some water to drink, looking for a place for Mary to rest. And when they came upon what they thought was the last place, and the inn was full, but the stable was available to them to make room for them, that they took advantage of it. And they brought Mary in so that she could rest that night. There was a place for them to stay, and the rest was history. But even with the, within the context of history, real emotions and real feelings, real, real stuff took place. And there were many unnamed characters that still 
and holy night. And although we do not have specifics, again, we're allowed to use our sanctified imagination. And when we contemplate without ever knowing for sure what happened in that cave or stable that night, and whatever caused the innkeeper to open his door to them, the innkeeper must have had a dilemma of belief. What on earth are these crazy people traveling now for? Sure, there's a census going on. Sure, there's, they need to register, but couldn't they have found a place before this woman was going to give birth to a child? Scholars and historians suggest that Jewish people of that day were expecting a Messiah to come. They were anxiously looking forward to that time, this point in history where Israel would receive the glory that they believed that they were due from God. There were hopes, there were expectations for someone to come, for someone to ease their dilemma, their struggle to believe that God could still remember them after four hundred years of silence. Perhaps the innkeeper that very night watched and saw the entourage of shepherds coming, the light that came from the star shining out in the back on his stable. He may have taken a peek later that evening, and maybe he and Estelle went out that night, and, and they tried to help the best that they could, not knowing what on earth was going on. Who knows? Maybe after a couple of days, he and his wife managed to find some room inside. But we don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But we can think about it, and we can wonder as long as we don't get preachy about those details. It's safe to say that whatever the innkeeper was thinking that night, whatever he had done that night, no matter what he felt, the profound reality that something had happened was taking place. God's sovereign timing, God's divine plan was happening. Did he know? Don't overlook the details that Luke does give us in the text. Verse 6, it says, And while they were there, the time for her birth came to pass. God's sovereignty doesn't mean that things happen just for a reason. I hear that expression. Do you hear that expression? Well, it was meant to be. It took place. Maybe it was meant to be because we did something wrong and something happened in our lives. Maybe it came to pass because we did something right. Whatever the case may be, God's sovereignty means that he does just the right thing at just the right time in just the right way, all for his glory and for our good. Wait a minute. Hold on, Pastor Andrew. That's where you made a mistake. Your sanctified imagination is all messed up. Because you don't know what I've been through this last year. You don't know the unrest and the lack of peace that I have in my life because of what happened to me this past year or this past three years or this past however long I've been alive. You seem to think that God could be in control? My life is so out of control, so messed up, that I find myself as, a, as an innkeeper in this lousy, stinking, small town called Bethlehem. And all I got to do is listening to complaining customers, the rooms aren't clean enough, the, 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 the beds aren't soft enough, the food isn't good enough, the water isn't clean enough. All I get to listen to is the complaints. The whining of these people. And now to boot, I got to find room for a guy who's got a lady with him that they're pregnant. And, and I don't have room. And I'm tired. And the last thing I want to do is give up my bed. My, I'm not doing it. 
fine. They can stay in the barn. Maybe the cows will move over and, oh, wait a minute. Maybe I'm getting a little carried away. God's sovereignty means to us that he just does what is right at the right time for his good and for our good and for his glory. See, the innkeeper maybe didn't have a clue about the timing, but God did. In fact, the Apostle Paul later wrote in the book of Galatians that he knew exactly what he was doing, the exact place of which would happen, everything described in the birth narrative. Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5 says this, But at just the right time, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy our freedom. Those of us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. Yeah, Albert the innkeeper probably had no idea that he was in step with God's perfect timing and eternity's perspective. And in fact, the inn was full. It was a physical reality, and the stable literally was not set up to be a maternity ward in any hospital. But it was part of God's plan. God decided that the manger would actually be a sign. A sign to the shepherds. You know those shepherds, the lowlifes, the dirty people that lived on the fringe. And while this may have been an eye-popping experience for the innkeeper to see when the shepherds came, he probably didn't understand what the purpose behind the birth in the barn would be. 1 John 3 verse 8 says, The reason the Son of God came and appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. What? On that night? In that place? In Bethlehem? See, the arrival or the advent of Jesus was the declaration of war from Almighty God to the kingdom of this earth. It was the first cry that the child made that seemed to break the silence in this world of loneliness for 400 years of silence for the people of Israel, the city of David, the town of Bethlehem. It was a shot across the bow. That the kingdom of darkness did not rule, and that the kingdom of our God rules forever. And I'm sure the innkeeper didn't have a clue as to the scope of what happened when that first baby cry came. But the reality that something beyond normal was there, just lurking in the shadow. And something must have begun to sink in that night out back in the stable. But I have a question. Is there something happening right now in our world today that God might be using to get your attention? Is there something going on Something that you've not seen ever before, ever in your lifetime. You've never even heard stories of it. And in the wildest of imaginations, in all of the historical reading that you may have read or not read, but you've heard stories of, is there something happening today in our world that God is saying, come on, guys, pay attention. Pay attention. For I am about to do something in your day that even if I told you, you would not believe. Habakkuk 1 verse 5. Life came into the world that night. And that life was the light of men, according to John. And it began to push back darkness. 
Victory was on the horizon and the works of the devil were right in the crosshairs of almighty God. You mean a child? Yes. A child who was born to die in our place. The plan of eternity past was becoming the reality and beginning to unfold. And although it never mentions it, the innkeeper played a significant part in the plan of God. Or somebody did. Somebody found a space for them, for Mary, for Joseph, and for the baby to be born. Someone gave room to start the greatest rescue mission ever planned, ever devised, and ever conceived of. And if it was Albert the innkeeper, then Albert did just what the Christmas carol says to us in Joy to the World. He prepared room for Jesus. Perhaps it was a beginning of faith journey for him. Perhaps he'd heard the story, the prophecy. Perhaps he knew a little bit about what was to come. Perhaps he anticipated a little bit. That just maybe sometime in his life that Messiah might come. Perhaps for the first time, Albert began to experience the peace of God. Maybe. For the first time, he began to experience a peace of God. Perhaps the celebration of the birth of Jesus could take place anywhere. But it fit Bethlehem at just the right time, at just the right place. And there was room for him. A space that was prepared before the foundation of this world. And there was room for us there. A place for us to begin our belief. This was the action step that the innkeeper took. He made room. There's always more going on in this world than you and I realize. We may think that, oh, it's because of this government or that government. It's because of that bad decision or that good decision. We might think that other people are in control. We might even complain and gripe and say, oh, my goodness, I don't like my prime minister or my president. We don't like our rulers and our bosses. But in the middle of the hustle and bustle of our Bethlehem, Someone is asking you the question, will you make room? Is there room for me? Jesus is here. He offers us hope. He offers us joy. He offers us peace because he loves us. God offers us life, one place, one person. It's in him. Yes, his name is Jesus. Gospel of John, Jesus said to his disciples in John 14, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house, there are many rooms. If that were not so, I would not have told you. And I am going away to prepare a place for you. But if I go away and prepare a place for you, I will surely come back and I will take you to be with me that we might be there together. Then Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how is it that we can know the way? But Jesus answered Thomas saying, I am the way and I am the truth and I am the life. And if you knew me, sorry, and no man comes to the Father except through me. And if you knew me, Jesus said, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him. And you have seen him. 
And verses 27 and 28, Jesus continued, and he said, peace I leave you, my peace I give to you. I do not give you peace like the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Because you heard me say, I am going away. But do not be afraid, because I am coming back for you. It's true. I may be your pastor and I may have studied the book, but I don't know what's going on in these days. I don't know what's happening in our world system. I don't know what's going on in the turmoil and the struggle in your life. I don't know the pain that you're going through, but I can promise you that there is one who does. And you're not in a place here today, believe it or not, you may think that you came here to please your mom. You may think that you came here to please your dad or your kids. You may think that you're doing this because you're a good dad and you're leading your household. You might think that you're the only one and you're the remnant. You might think you're doing it because, hey, you didn't have anything else to do on a Sunday morning. But I want to tell you this. You are not here today for this moment by accident. You're here because God's incredible love for you displayed first as a child in Christ Jesus. The one who came, innocent child, born of a virgin, lived a sinless, sinless, sinless life, and yet was accused, found guilty, convicted, then tortured on your behalf and put to death. And yet he didn't stay dead. The scriptures teach us that he was raised to life for you, for me. If you have not, if you think in any way that this message is not for you, whether you know the story or not, let it be a reminder to your heart. God is here. He is near in the person of Jesus because he loves you. Will you make room for him? I tried that once before and uh, didn't make much of a difference. I tried it, gave it my best. All right, well, I didn't give it my best. I just, you know, I gave it some time, right? After all, I'm busy. Okay, all right. So I gave him a little bit of time. Okay, well, look, I'm a busy innkeeper. I got things to do. I got places to go. I got customers who are coming. I got meals to make. It's breakfast in a few hours. And Estelle's busy already. She's got way too much to do on her plate. It's all about me right now. And look, it, it, it is. I'm not being a, a, a cry baby. I, there's stuff I got to do. After all, I, I got my life ahead of me. true the picture that i painted isn't going the way that i thought i thought that if you stayed within the numbers and put the colors in the right spot everything would come out right and the picture would show the right way who am i to it's god's fault i'm colorblind but god has invited us into what he is doing right here right now on Main Street right here at the end of 2022. And he invites us to find peace in his sovereignty, in his rule, in his control of what's already happening right here in our world, right where you are. The question is, do you believe it? Will you find peace this Christmas? Will you find joy? Will you allow yourself to hope again in a God that really does love you? Will you prepare him room this Christmas? When you meet Jesus, your life will never be the same. As you keep 
watch over your events of this day, of the comings and goings in our world of this day? Do you know that there is someone greater keeping watch over you? Will you trust him today? I have. And he's made the difference in my life. And there's no turning back. And no matter how high the wave, no matter how strong the wind, no matter how firm the opposition, I can say it is well with my soul. God always does just the right thing in just the right way at just the right time for his glory and for your good. Will you make room for him? Will you believe? Let's pray. Thank you, God, that you have not forgotten about me. Thank you that you have not forgotten about any one of us here. Thank you that your word says that at just the right time, in just the right place, you came. And you gave yourself as a sacrifice for us. so that we could be with you one day. Lord, it is true that the Christmas story can be lost on us because we are so caught up in life of today and also because we've heard it so many times. But God, just today, would you tell us again how much you loved us that you gave your one and only son, that if we would believe you offer us eternal life. We know that you did not send your son into this world to point an accusing finger at us, to remind us of how bad we were, to remind us of how messed up we are. You came to help. You came to set things straight again. And so, even though there's no grapes in the barns, in the vines, no grain in the barns, no sheep in the pen, no cattle in the fields, today we choose to trust you, God. And even though we can't believe what's going on in this world right now, and there's so much upset and so much turmoil, God, we will stand by faith that even though we don't see, we will believe because you've said it. And today, we make room for you. Even so, come Lord Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Our final song this morning is going to be Silent Night. Um, Abigail, would you like to come and stand with me and do your signing? Because it's so wonderful. I'm watching you as we're singing, and it's the very, very, very pretty. You're good. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, let's stand as we sing our final song this morning. It's right there, too.
need it. Thank you so much, Abigail. So Jesus is Lord. I mean, you might think that that's just a nice saying. It's comfortable to say. I mean, we've heard it. But is he? Have you allowed him to be Lord in your life? There are people that walk up and down this street every single day. Most of those people have probably heard the Christmas story. And yeah, they may have not heard of Albert, the innkeeper. They probably also don't know your name. But you might be that one person who speaks hope and life to them so that they might know that God loves them, that God stooped down from glory and came as a baby, Jesus, to give them hope and to give them life. If the end of 2022, 2021, 2020, and 2019 weren't enough for you to know that things are a changing, then just maybe today you can acknowledge that God does have a plan. And your name is written all over it. That's why you're here today. That's why we're in the shadow of this steeple. That's why God placed us on Main Street. Isn't that great news? We're part of his plan. <laughs> Yay, God. We're part of his plan. And like that great theologically sound Christmas program, Santa Claus is coming to town, yeah. says, if you don't know what to do first, just put one foot in front of the other because he's not asking you to run the marathon he's asking you to start where you are so father you deserve all glory all praise in our sanctified imaginations we can only begin to glimpse and grab a hold of a little bit of what it was like that night when the angels shouted, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill to all men on whom his favor rests. In this day, your favor rests on us. Don't let us squander it but let us make room for you in Jesus name. Amen. And now don't you dare come back here next Sunday. Don't come back here on Christmas Eve. If you want to play church, don't do it. In fact, I would hesitate to say you're not welcome, but if you want to come back, because you want to know what it's like to live together as a community called the church, because there's people outside that need to know Jesus, and you have a part to play, then I double dog dare you not to come back so that we can do it together because we need each other. God bless you, church. Merry Christmas. <laughs>